Hello, hello, hello. This is Nicholas, and I'm checking if my microphone was on, and it was, so that's good. <laughs> um, in the last video, I derived the real valued Fourier series, if you will. In other words, nothing in the previous video was with complex numbers. Um, a lot of times, the Fourier series will use complex numbers, and so that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. I'm going to derive the complex version of the Fourier series. So remember that in the last video, the real version of the Fourier series was given by f of x. Uh, that's going to be equal to a naught. Oh, I wrote another uh, plus sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a n cosine of nx plus sigma n equals 1 to infinity of b n sine of nx. And this was the real valued Fourier series we did in the last video. And we spent our time finding what formulas uh, what the formulas are for a naught, for a n, and for b n. Um, now we're going to go complex. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, recall Euler's formula. So um, in other words, that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i times the sine of theta. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace cosine of nx and sine of nx with their complex uh, definitions. So... Um, another thing you might notice is that if I have e to the negative i theta, I would get, in other words, I'm plugging in negative theta here instead of theta. I get cosine of negative theta, which is just cosine of theta because cosine is even. And then I would have i times the sine of negative theta. The sine of negative theta is negative the sine of theta. So in other words, I get minus, uh, minus i times the sine of theta. And from here, I get two equations. I can solve for cosine and sine and get their complex definitions relatively easily. If I add these two together, um, then these will cancel out. And I would end up getting that e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta all over 2 is cosine of theta. And that's a perfectly valid definition for the cosine. Um, likewise, if I were to subtract, if I were to subtract these two, um, I would get e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i is equal to the sine of theta. And again, that's the uh, complex definition of sine if you weren't already familiar with that. Um, one other thing I would just like to point out, it uh, isn't really related all that much to the Fourier series, but notice that uh, this gives some motivation for the hyperbolic trig function definitions because... Uh, if you, I mean, just look at them, uh, the, co the cosh of theta, in other words, the hyperbolic cosine of theta, cosh theta, that's defined to be e to the theta plus e to the negative theta over 2, and cinch, or hyperbolic sine of theta, is e to the theta minus e to the minus i, th or mi minus theta, no i there, all over 2. So, uh, hopefully you can see the blaring similarities between the two, and uh, that's where some of the kind of nice properties uh, about uh, cosh and cosine come together. For example, that cosine of i theta is the same thing as cosh theta, um, things like that. Okay, um, now back to the Fourier series. So what we can do is here we would have theta being equal to nx, right, because our angle here is, our, is nx. So what we would get now is what we're going to replace uh, cosine and sine with their complex definitions. So we're going to get a naught plus sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a n times uh, e to the i n x plus e to the negative i n x all over 2 plus sigma n equals 1 to infinity of b n times e to the i n x minus e to the minus i n x over 2i. And then from there, what I can do is, um, what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to group each term uh, by e to the i n x and e to the negative i n x. So basically, I'm going to find the coefficients of e to the i n x and e to the negative i n x. And I'm going to write it as one uh, summation. So I'll write it as a naught plus sigma n equals one to infinity 
of now i'm gonna kind of like put parentheses here so we have e to the i n x and then in the parentheses going to be my coefficient plus uh some other coefficient e to the negative i n x okay so now we basically say well what is happening with the coefficient of e to the i n x well uh notice we're going to have an a sub n over two so we have that and then we also have a Oh, uh, one other thing I would like to do before I go on further is I'm going to take this here. Uh, you know, I don't like to be on the bottom. I like to be on the top. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this after multiplying by I over I, that'll become I E to the negative I N X minus I E to the I N X over two. Um, so now I'm going to use that instead. So we have an a sub n over 2, a sub n over 2. And then we also have uh, this whole thing is being multiplied by b sub n, right? So uh, we also have a minus i b sub n, right? That's this part, like, uh, it's this i and this b sub n, basically. So uh, we have a sub n minus i b sub n. Okay. And then likewise, we're going to be dividing by 2 here. Uh, here we have, an again, an a sub n over 2. And then we would have a plus i b, because we're in i b, <laughs> plus i b sub n over 2. And notice that it works out kind of conveniently that these happen to be complex conjugates of one another. Um, so... What that tells you is that we can um, we can change the uh, index here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up into two separate sums. So uh, rather than writing it all, oh, whatever, I'll write it out. Um, a naught plus sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n minus i b sub n over 2 times e to the i n x plus sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n plus i b sub n over 2 times e to the negative i n x. And now here the goal basically is we can say, well, how can we uh, combine these two together, right? Like, wouldn't it be nice if we had this being a positive i n x because then we could combine this sum and this sum. And, uh, well, yes, it would be nice. And so how are we going to make that happen? Well, what we can do is basically we can take the second sum here and we can re-index it. So how we're going to re-index is we're basically going to have n go to negative n. And so what that does is every time you see an n, you replace it with a negative n, including on the bounds here of the sum, right? So that would make a negative n go from 1 uh, and then negative n go to infinity. So what that really becomes is that we have the sum from n equals negative 1. Uh, oh, uh, okay, well, let me write it like this. Okay, uh, see, we have negative n equals infinity. In other words, n equals negative infinity. So our lower bound is n equals negative infinity. And then our upper bound is negative n equals 1, or in other words, n equals negative 1. So we have the sum from negative infinity to negative 1 of uh, a sub negative n plus i b sub negative n all over 2. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this uh, closely here. See, I'm going to define this part right here, the coefficient, uh, or sorry, I'm going to define this part right here. Uh, you'll see that they're actually the same in a moment, but... Uh, the coefficient in front of the e to the i n x, I'm going to define that as c sub n. And then it would make sense that this a naught would also be equal to c naught because uh, we would just be letting n equal zero there. Um, so now in the second sum here, uh, notice that now the e to the negative i n x, this is the whole point, now becomes a e to the positive i n x because we would have e to the negative i negative n x so now then notice that um this coefficient in front now in this red sum of the 
like right here, this coefficient right here, is also the same thing as c sub n. It's the same thing as c sub positive n because uh, we have all negative bounds on our summation. So in other words, we can write this just as one sum, and that one sum would be f of x equals the sum, and we have from our most lower bound of negative infinity, or our lowest, most lower, to our uh, upper bound of infinity. Uh, so we have sum from n equals negative infinity to infinity of c sub n uh, times e to the i n x. And that is the formula for the complex Fourier series. Um, really pretty nice, and I think even easier than the real-valued Fourier series. Um, one thing I would like to just do is that, and probably you've said in your mind now as well, uh, well, what's C sub n, right? We need to find what C sub n is, otherwise this would all just be for looks, right? So how can we do that? Well, we could do that in a similar way we found A sub n and B sub n for the real-valued Fourier series, and we're basically going to multiply by something that uh, will let us just solve for C sub n. And that's something that we can introduce is e to the negative i m x. M, not n. Um, so why does this work? Well, because then when we multiply those things together, uh, we will get a nice integral. So we're also going to integrate from negative pi to pi just like we did earlier. So we have the integral from negative pi to pi of f of x dx is equal to sigma n equals negative infinity to n equals infinity of c sub n integral negative pi to pi of e to the um, i n x times e to the negative i m x dx. And now we can... Uh, fool around with this a little bit. So this integral right here, um, again, has two cases, just like in the real Fourier series, right? So we have the case where m equals n and the case where m does not equal n. So in the case where m does not equal n, uh, we're going to get a zero. Um, because we would be having a symmetric bound there. And you can do the integration for yourself if you uh, don't believe me or whatever. Um, and when m equals n, we would just be integrating 1. Um, and so along a, a length of 2 pi, so that gives us an answer of 2 pi there. Uh, so now uh, we again can say that since n goes from negative infinity to infinity and m is some positive integer, then somewhere in this sum, n has to be equal to m, and everywhere else it has to be equal to zero. So in other words, we're just going to get a bunch of zeros plus the one term of 2 pi c sub n. Oh, uh, my bad. I just realized, and uh, sorry if I confuse you here, I forgot to write the, uh, it was right, I just forgot to write it on the left side. On the left side, we also have to multiply by the same thing. So f of x e to the negative i m x dx. I uh, just forgot to multiply it on the left side as well. So now we can solve for c sub n. And again, notice that since this here, this is a definite integral, it doesn't matter whether we use m or n. Since we have a c sub n, I will make it a e to the, oops, I'll make it a e to the negative i n x instead, since we have a c sub n. And so that means that c sub n is just given by 1 over 2 pi times the integral from negative pi to pi of f of x times e to the negative i n x dx. And so this right here is really the only building block of our Fourier series, which is nice because, well, it's less things to remember. First of all, uh, you only have to remember one formula for C sub n, and uh, it's only one summation, right, from negative infinity to infinity. It's not two separate sums of sines and cosines.
So personally, I really do think that the um, complex Fourier series is easier than the real valued Fourier series, but uh, that's up to personal preference, really. Um, in the next video, I'll be doing the Fourier series for e to the x and kind of exploring some results that you get using the real and complex Fourier series. And then I'll be posing a problem to you that I have yet to figure out the solution to. So if you could help me with it, I would appreciate it. Um, with that video, or with that, with that video, with that, with that, with that, <laughs> with that, uh, 